Well, hello, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the show. I normally uh, start by giving you guys an opportunity to, to let the audience know a little bit about your background, where you came from, and how you ended up here. So, uh, Joshua, since you're uh, the star of the today, why don't you go ahead and start, and then we'll bounce to Nate. All right. Uh, my name is Josh Hedberg. I'm the director of sales for BioAg. I've been doing that for uh, creeping up on, uh, I think, the four or five year mark now. Uh, I've been working with uh, the company BioAg for a little over, right around uh, the 20 year mark. Uh, 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 how I got into the industry was uh, I used to be uh, an owner and employee at a, a garden uh, store in Salem, Oregon called the Indoor Garden Center, uh, ran by my friend Rick Williams. Uh, which I took over after his uh, unfortunate early passing due to cancer. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been in the industry a long time. I've been uh, uh, growing medical marijuana since about 2006, I believe, or 2005 was when I got my first license. Uh, I actually uh, discovered uh, Dr. Bob uh, Faust's uh, uh, products because he was a customer of mine. And uh, I was importing humic and fulvic acids uh, from Canada. And uh, the Department of Ag came in one day and said, uh, that stuff's not registered. You can't sell it. And Bob was in the store and he popped off with, uh, hey, uh, I have mine's registered and I sell it to farmers in 55 gallon drums. And I'm like, why am I ordering this stuff from Canada, Bob? And then we slowly took all of his products uh, and put them into small containers and packages for everybody. But we kept them at ag concentration and ag pricing and, you know, uh, been selling them ever since. You know, my store is gone and I'm still selling them. Nice. Nice. And Nate, where, what about you, my friend? Um, so I own and operate a potting soil business. We manufacture uh, high quality, small batch living soil. Uh, we've been operating officially for about three years. Um, I've been you know, selling kind of soil as a side business for a few years before that. And I've been making my own potting soil for my own garden uh, for probably 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, I've been a cannabis enthusiast since about the year 2000 and been uh, gardening since about 2005 or 2006. Um, and I kind of got drawn into making my own soil from seeing some of the products that uh, some of my peers were producing in soil that they had made. Um, so kind of got, you know, got into it that way. And also from just being, uh, a little bit disappointed with some of the lackluster performance of bagged soils, uh, that I had been purchasing and been using. So, um, you know, getting into making organic potting soil has been definitely a, a project of passion for me. And it just kind of aligned with, with my views of, uh, kind of how I like to eat my food and how I like to smoke my, my herb and, uh, you know, where I feel like true quality comes from, uh, from, from a, a good quality soil. Oh, I'm into that. <laughs> so, um, is it a soilless medium that you're working uh, with? It, it, it is, uh, you know, like a modified growing medium. Um, it's essentially a, a two to one for the base. It's a two to one ratio of, uh, peat to cocoa for aeration. We use rice hulls, pumice, perlite, um, for the compost, we use verma, uh, verma compost or uh, worm castings kind of as our sole compost source. Um, and then we use a bunch of different ingredients, which include shrimp meal, bone meal, insect frass, neem seed meal, soybean meal, uh, seabird guano, some different rock dust sources, alfalfa, different calcium sources and stuff like that. Um, our soil is unique in the fact that, you know, it takes a long time for us to make it. We compost it for about six to eight weeks. We return it multiple times during that composting process. And we hit temperatures of about 160, 100, 165 degrees along that composting process. So it's very nutrient dense and, um, you know, it doesn't burn plants in the way that like some other hot or nutrient dense soils might because we've kind of composted it and given it time to settle, given it time to have the pH balance and, uh, uh, some of that nitrogen for, for that to burn off as well. Nice. And then how do you, how do you two know each other? Uh, we met, uh, when I had my store in Salem, Oregon and, uh, Nate was looking to start, uh, making soil on a large scale. And I gave him a hand, uh, starting that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's been, uh, we've been, uh, definitely like sharing some smoke for a long time and, uh, mm -hmm. sharing some information and, and, uh, he's been, he's been great in terms of like helping me get my business launched and, uh, just, just a wealth of information to like bounce some ideas off of and, uh, just a, a good overall friend. So it's yeah. good. 
Nate yeah. kind of reignited my fire for the industry after being very burnt out after running a retail business for 16 years. Uh, but most of that time I was gardening uh, with uh, hydroponics and using different uh, uh, mineral salts and, you know, uh, you know, with heavy use of organics with it. But, uh, uh, you know, after seeing what he was able to accomplish with his soils and uh, what other people were doing with their soils, uh, I saw that there was a place to uh, basically what he was doing was better than mine. And I couldn't have that. So uh, I had to change up and I had to do, you know, what works best. And that's a simple fact of the matter is, you know, I have a, of the opinion that uh, if you're going to grow marijuana for all the reasons, you want to grow it organically with living soil. It produces a better product that lasts on the shelf longer and is higher quality and it's cheaper to produce. That's just the fact. <laughs> I know, right? Why is it so hard to convince these salt guys that they're they're not uh, going down the right path? They've been they've been sold a bucket of lies for so long, man. We all have, you know, with the three hundred dollar frosty tomato fertilizers and the ready made hydroponic systems and all these things uh, that have been sold to us that we don't need, you know. But people in our industry have been solving their problems with money instead of good sense for years because they could, you know, when when weed was four thousand dollars a pound. Yeah, you know, you could uh, uh, you could do that. You could have a absolutely wonderful uh, little garden that would uh, support your whole family with a, a you know a couple six thousand watts. But uh, that was that was a long time ago, and that's not today. You know, today it's a, a commodity like any other. Well, it's got to be treated like a crop, and that crop, uh, you know, you've got to you know waste is no good. You cannot afford to grow a a, a plant and make profit off it when you're spending $200 uh, for 25 pounds of uh, salt fertilizer. That's not good. You're rip, being ripped off. Straight up, you know, you buy that same exact bag. You go to any major hydro store today and you can buy a 1500 calcium nitrate for at least five different price points from anywhere from $200 to 60 bucks. You know, and it's the same exact product. There's no difference. You know, the difference is the label and, uh, you know, who's making money. That's it. Yep. The old you know, campus tax. Green tax. It's all over our industry and it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, noticed that pretty quickly when I first got involved. I mean, I came out of uh, large commercial scale uh, restorations of parks and, and uh, engineered soil systems. And got burned out at the end of that <clears throat> just due to the fact that <clears throat> I'd spend X amount of time, you know, getting the biology up to where it needed to be and the keys over to the owner, the new manager, and then go right back to salts. And I was just like, why am I doing this? What is, what is the purpose? What is the point? Exactly. And it got so bad that, you know, some of these I was doing, you know, helping permit these, you know, mega mansions on these sensitive watersheds selling the town and all these different committees that, Hey, you know, this is a hundred percent organic. We're not using any synthetics, no, no pesticides whatsoever. And they, you know, open the friggin' door and let me, you know, just pretty much run whatever I wanted to. But problem was after when I turned the keys over to the new homeowner, um, I said to them, you know, make sure you use an organic, uh, uh landscaper company and, uh, please tell them that, you know, I'm the one that's going to be treating the fertility. They just here to, you know, cut, blow and go. And often I'd come pull up to make a compost extract and I'd see, you know, five guys jump out of a van with backpack sprays. I'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you guys spraying? Well, we're spraying fungicides because there's a few mushrooms around. I'm like, that's because they're over irrigating, not because we have a problem. So they'd set me back like nine months in one day. And so it was like, you know, fuck this. I don't care how much money you're paying me. I, this is not what I'm doing. You know, this isn't what I'm doing it for. I'm not doing it to, to make money. I'm doing it to, you know, fix, start fixing some of the problems that we have, especially in the residential uh, areas that are pretty much on all these sensitive watersheds. So then I drifted into the cannabis industry um, and that was back, you know, whew, 17 and it was still booming back then. I mean, it wasn't fantastic, but it was still, very lucrative business to be involved in. And like you said, once the money left, the common sense left, everybody left. And yep. the only people that were left were the big players that were focused purely on money and they didn't give a shit about, you know, plant itself. So yeah, that's it was it was frustrating to see 
what could have been a really beautiful thing. And, you know, in many ways, I truly believe that cannabis was going to be that plant that changed big ag because when they saw what we could do and the savings that we could create and the way we could better steward the soil, it's no brainer to, to do it this way. But, you know, since then the, the demise of the cannabis industry is pretty much not opened the eyes of big ag in a way that I would have hoped it could have. Um, anyway, that was a tangent. I, <laughs> well, well, we're, uh, uh, we're still working on that, uh, uh, on that side, you know, uh, you know, uh, I get uh, contacted by, uh, the ag people who purchase from bio ag all the time asking about what's this stuff they heard about that they're using on these cannabis farms. So, uh, you know, we're getting there. It's just a slow, slow process to get to, you know, into that, you know, you know how ag is, you know, that, you know, the, I thought uh, uh, working with cannabis farmers that they were stubborn. And then I got introduced. Then I got to go to an ag show. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing it this way for 30 years and we exactly. know what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. You know, the, what we run into at BioAg more often than not is, you know, it's the grandson. It's the third generation or the fourth you know, granddad and dad have been killing the soil with chemicals. Great granddad used to be all organic. You know, his yields were, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting a, 120 bushels per acre. They were getting something crazy like 180 with their chemicals. We're down to 80. How do we get back to granddad? Because his was quality was better. And, you know, we don't want to buy seed every year. And we, you know, don't want to buy fertilizer every year. How do we get back to what, we, what he was doing, that regenerative agriculture that everyone did pre-World War II? Mm -hmm. you know that it was fear it was fear of not being able to produce enough that fear is over you know the only thing we're doing by promoting uh, so much nitrogen into the soils is uh, uh you know causing more global warming ruining the soils and wasting money on a large scale there's far easier ways to get there and there's far more cost effective ways to get there they're going to help everyone it's just you know like you said it's you know screaming at the wall yeah yeah i know that all too well i I have a client, um, a corn bean and corn farmer down in uh, Illinois, who took the leap of faith because of the cost of nitrogen uh, back when the Ukrainian war started. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm not sure he would have completely committed, but he dove in and, and he did really well the first year um, with just one application of fish brew. And when we sat down and did the numbers, his his cost per bushel was like 25 cents versus a dollar 50. And I'm like, why can't you tell the farmers, look, look at my numbers and look at what I spent. I mean, that should be enough to turn anybody on a dime. I mean, that's literally, you know, seven X savings. Well, he goes, farmers, uh, they don't look at the cost per bushel. They only care about the bushels per acre. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't matter if you're at the end of the day, everybody's here to earn money. We're not here to, to, to do anything other than earn money. So if you're, if you can earn seven times more with half the work or less than half the work, why wouldn't they? And he goes, no, they never talk about money. They don't care how much it costs them. All they want to do is brag about how many bushels per acre they have. Yep. That's, that's where I hit the wall, dude. Like I, I, I didn't know how to take that any further with, with, you know, the local farms around him. Um, maybe you can figure out a way to, to break that mold. Uh, we're working on it. You know, it's just slowly, uh, you know, slowly getting them there, you know, but uh, you know, it's, you know, slowly as people convert over to this, you know, like a, a great example uh, is a gentleman I introduced Nate to uh, last year uh, named German Tom. And he does about a hundred thousand acres of no-till in Germany. And uh, uh, he only buys four products for his entire farm. Molasses, uh, silica, humic acid, and humic acid fortified with uh, uh, micronutrients. So three stuff from bioag and molasses. Everything else comes from the pigs and the ground and the mushrooms it produces. You know, and everything is no-till. So he does rotating cover crops, you know, and that takes care of any uh, issues he has. And, you know, frankly, he's got some of those amazing uh, 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 compost piles and compost teas I've ever seen. You know, uh, but uh, it's uh, slowly turning people on to these uh, programs and, you know, educating them. You know, you don't have to spend this money, you know, and you can get a lot more out of it by adding animals and back with it. You know, that's the answer to all of those large scale problems. Is you got to bring all these farms that are growing one thing and they got to start working together and growing more than one thing. 
you don't want to grow corn. Guess what? You need pigs. You know, you need alfalfa. You need, you know, several different things to make that work. You know, otherwise you're just going to be causing more of a mess and it's going to cost you too much to produce a lower quality product. Yep. You know, and the more we see that, the less uh, the way we do things in North America are going to be accepted other places, you know, because they're they're still they're going to be adapting to this all over the world. You know, and we can either catch up with them or we can fall behind again. Very well put. Very well put. Nate, do you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation here? I mean, I, I just, I enjoy where the general direction of this conversation is going, man. I mean, I, you know, I think you, you kind of nailed it spot on with how things have changed since World War II and basically the, between the military industrial complex and the petroleum, you know, the petroleum industry and, you know, where these fertilizers have come from and, and you know, being sold to farmers as some sort of mir miracle that, you know, is going to add you know, put money in their pockets, make their, you know, make their jobs easier. And, and really it's just degraded the quality of soil over time. And, you know, not only is it uh, hurting farmers, but, you know, you look at the effects that it has on, you know, the land, the waterways, you know, the dead zones outside of the major rivers uh, that empty into the oceans. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's affecting, you know, a whole lot more than just the farmers. And, uh, you know, getting everybody educated about what's going on. And, you know, I, I think that that's kind of the most important thing. And, you know, if if people could just be more, more in tune with the biology of what's going on underneath their feet, you know, I wouldn't say that we would even have to completely eradicate all, all chemical fertilizers. I mean, I think there would be a way that we could integrate those with more biological practices and, and not just do uh, organic farming, but just, you know, biological farming um but the need for those things would be drastically reduced um mm -hmm. and the benefits the benefits could be huge yeah that's a that's a great example you know chemicals used efficiently and responsibly are very very different than what we're talking about yes yeah so true um, you know I, i've seen hydroponic systems run responsibly where they're running incredibly low ecs you know pumping their plants up with biostimulants having a very healthy environment to use as little as they can to grow as much as you can. And if you don't, if you're not, if you're in the desert and you don't have any soil and all you got is sun, what else are you going to do? You know, I, I each place for its own, you know, thing, you know, but, uh, but to say that, uh, you know, one way is going to be the way is probably not, you know, it's got to have to be a compromise and you're going to, it's going to depend on where you're at, where you live. So let me ask you two gentlemen, have you ever heard of fish brew? Fish brew. It does sound familiar. So yeah. right now on the market, there's fish shit, food, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then fish brew. So mm -hmm. fish brew is is basically how I got involved in this whole industry was mm -hmm. basically I was taking, you know, aquaculture, aquaponics is the use of fish to grow plants. Uh, most people don't understand. It's not like literally taking the fish and burying it under the ground and putting a seed on top of it. Mm -hmm. This is more about taking fish manure, which is uh, just crazy loaded with, with the nutrient cyclers. So protozoa, fungi, as well as nematodes. And so back, you know, after my divorce, I went back to what I loved and was passionate about. And I go around to different aquaculture companies, um, land-based, obviously, and I would harvest their, their fish waste, and then I would aerobically stabilize it and then use it and I put it on plants, the plants exploded, but I didn't know why. So that's why I ended up going down to Rodale to meet this woman named Elaine, who I didn't know who she was at the time. i come to find out it's Elaine Ingham. And she basically took me under her wing and showed me, you know, what all of the other things around it were. In other words, compost, vermicompost, uh, thermal versus mesophilic versus stag uh, stagnant. Uh, soil organic farming versus this hybrid mix of chemical and, and organic and, you know, the whole, the whole gamut. And so the reason I ask you guys about this is because during the pandemic, my friend Keith Wilda, who I've known for probably 15 years now, and in the beginning, he laughed a lot about, you know, my passion for fish shit, because I'll be honest, guys, if I'd go, some of these farms I'd go to, if I got this stuff on me, I had to throw my clothes away. You could not wash it out. If you got it on your skin, you smelled nasty for about two to three days. And 
I quickly realized that there was an issue with those types of manure versus the manures that didn't have that kind of problem. And that was that the anaerobes were so thick and taken over, concentrated, that they had basically eliminated the aerobic uh, contingencies that were laying in wait. Mm -hmm. So I would teach these farmers, these aquaculture guys, how to you know, change their sand filters, get rid of their biological filters, get a better rotary screen drum filter, and just build the aerobic or go into the facultative side, facultative anaerobes to get their fish health up. And then when I did that by default, now I had a material that I could stabilize in an hour or two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot less work, right? And if I got some on me, I didn't smell like shit for, for days. So win-win, right? And then plus the health of their fish was better. They didn't have to deal with the mortalities. Uh, you know, just again, win-win when right down the line. Mm -hmm. so, so Keith calls me during COVID, screams at me, like, you know, yelling at me because he saw fish shit being sold for $185 a quart at the hydro store. And I was like, Keith, you're a fucking idiot. I've been telling you for 15 years, you're flushing gold down the goddamn toilet. Why don't you start your own business, man? I'll promote you. I, you know I use your stuff. He actually went so far as to build a filter for me on his farm in uh, Cape Cod. And that farm is really, really special because it has freshwater diatoms. Now, diatoms are a microorganism that is really unique uh, in the essence that it can take minerals from the water as a food source or it can use light as a food source. And what it creates is bioavailable silica. More importantly, it creates oxygen as a byproduct of its growing. Mm -hmm. So getting these diatoms back into the soil, well, we build the oxygen in the soil. That means you can have a higher density population of bacteria, a quicker transition from dirt to soil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I highly recommend you to uh, go, to the, go to the website, fishbrew.com, Mm -hmm. reach out to Keith, tell him that you're associate of me and you guys start carrying this stuff because it literally is the key to taking dirt and turning it back to soil. Now it's the one of the three foundational products I use. I make biocomplete compost. I use vermicompost and I use fish brew exclusively mm -hmm. I put it together. I strip out the organic matter and the biology and then whatever's left, I put back into my compost pile. But for a soil builder and a, and a guy like you, uh, you know, I, I was told Bob about bio or about fish brew probably, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. But of mm -hmm. course, he wasn't in business at that point, but he understood the value of what I was mm -hmm. talking about. So please, you know, to reach out to this guy because you guys, this, this, especially you, Nate, I mean, it'll turn your living soil into something that you can't even imagine. Because remember, when you're getting into those high temps, you're cooking off a lot of shit. So it's going to take time mm -hmm. for that biology to come back into play. Well, this is this is instant, man. You just take a quart of this stuff, mix it with five gallons of water, put it on your soil, or sell it to them as an additive. Tell them to install it once their soil is installed. You're going to have incredible results. I mean, just astronomically different. Yeah, I would I would love to check it out. Um, we do we do re inoculate the soil after the uh, after the composting process. But I mean, you know, more biological diversity is usually better. You know, so I would love to check it out. Yeah, you, you, you'll you see incredible results. I, I guarantee it. Yeah. One of the things that uh, uh, we're running into here in Oregon and uh, Nevada particularly is the finding good quality fish compost and good quality fish uh, uh, liquids. You know, most of them uh, in Oregon we can't use anymore because of the heavy metal content, you know, on like a Pacific Fish and some of these other uh, products. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, gardens were digging hot on uh, arsenic or lead uh, using a lot of those uh, cheaper fish inputs that, you you know, uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, what's the older, Alaskan, you know, I, and some of those, you know, older uh, uh, brands. Uh, they're just uh, no good anymore. In fact, uh, uh, Nate had to do quite a bit of adjusting on his uh, mix when those uh, 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 heavy metals uh, testing came into the cannabis industry here in Oregon. But, uh, uh, you know, finding a good quality uh, uh, fish extract, I, I think it's it's hard to replace, you know, that, uh, you know, what it does to a plant, the type of green you get out of a cannabis plant when you can use a good fish fertilizer. 
I mean, uh, it, it's hard to find that from anywhere else. Yeah, and he does make his own hydrolysate too. Mm -hmm. And more importantly is the understanding of the way he makes it. He does a cold press, mm -hmm. so you're not losing anything. And more importantly, he does not take any of the oils. All the other big boys take the oils and sell that because it's worth so much money. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a stripped down product that, that has has plant reaction, but not potentially what it could have. Oh, yeah, you know that's that's the big difference between like uh, bioags full power and all the other fulvic acids on the market. Yeah. They're using right. hydroxides. They're stripping out all the all the good stuff so they can get as much as they can, and it tests high on the test, which means nothing. You know whether your humic acid is 0.5 percent or whether it's you know uh, uh you know one and a half percent. You know it, it, what matters is the performance. The the amount of uh, a fulvic in there is, is kind of relative. It's kind of like silica. You know that's already regulated by the plant. You don't need more. More does not mean better. You know higher numbers do not mean better. You know you don't need. You know it's same thing with organic fertilizer. This is the one thing I, I have a problem with a, when I'm talking with a lot of older fertilizers. They're like, I gotta have my triple twenty. I gotta have my my uh, 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 my uh, 10, 50, 10. I got to have my 10, uh, 50, 30. And I'm like, nah, dude, you can get by with triple five. You can get by with a, you know, a two, two, two insect grass and see amazing results. You know, you can use a simple fish fertilizer that has a, a you know, like a, a five point something, point something, and still see amazing results out of your, uh, 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 out of your plants. You know, the, you know, the NPK values are kind of a misnomer unless you're talking about petrochemicals. But now you're you're paying the gas man again. Oh man, so well put. Something that absolutely blew my mind was um, this guy Jeff Frank that I knew. He was the one actually that just kept bugging me to go see Elaine until I finally broke and went and saw her. But he uh, he took care of the Firestones Botanical Garden, Arizona, mm -hmm. and the Firestones. We all know who they are. Very yeah. very wealthy, powerful people, and. They had the desire to build the most incredible botanical garden, you know, in that state. And they successfully did it. Um, but Jeff was running it. He had 30 or 40 employees underneath him. And they were struggling because they were only using synthetics to keep these plants alive in these environments that these plants shouldn't be alive in. Mm -hmm. And so he got involved with Elaine. Elaine came down and basically showed him how to start making compost and how to start building soil so that these plants that were living in this new environment had some of the qualities of where they came from. So the understanding between uh, say a, a plant that lived in a jungle versus on a mountainside. So she launched him into the next realm of being able to take care of these plants. He was able actually able to cut his crew back. They didn't spend as much money every year and replacing plants. And so had a wonderful success there, but, as part of his job, you know, underneath the Firestones, this is, you know, this was a no joke job, mm -hmm. um, was to research the different types of fertilizers because they were complaining to him that, oh fuck, we got to bring another hundred thousand dollar plant in from India because you killed the last one, and so he had to go figure out like, all right, well, what is the difference between a five ten five or a thirty twenty thirty, you know, what is it, right? So he toured all these different fertilizer companies. And basically, it was a joke in the companies. They would literally change out the bag with a new name, a new label, pull the switch and start filling them. And he's like, wait a yep. minute. It, 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 it has a different number on it. And they go, oh, don't worry about it. It's all the same. Are you fucking kidding me? And oh, yeah. that, that was legit. That's what they do. And they still do it to this day. They, they want a different price. They, oh, we, this is 2020, 20, 20, 50, 50, 50, 50, whatever. And the customer doesn't know any better. They're going to pay for it, even though it's the same shit as the 15, 15, 15. Exactly. I, when I had my hydro store, uh, when it, uh, uh, you know, I first took it over and it, it was officially mine and my partners, uh, I had, uh, uh, I think, three different products that was a triple 20 at three different price points. You know, there was the old uh, Grow More, you know, which is a 25 pound bag. And I think I sold that for like 60 bucks. Then there was uh, another brand out of Canada, uh, and I want to say that was uh, $28 for 500 grams. And uh, uh, then there was uh, uh, another one. I, uh, who was it that was selling that? Uh, I want to say it was uh, uh, it might have been an advanced nutrients product, but it was another powder that was, uh, and I want to say it was about $45 for about a pound. 
know, and uh, the only difference you could tell between the three of them when you used them was the color of the powder. <laughs> that's it. That, that's all you could tell. You know, I, you know, it's like, oh, this one's so much better. Uh, and I was like, okay, what happens if I take the, take the cheap one and I follow the directions on the expensive one? Holy shit, I got the same results. <laughs> you know, I, and I'm like, what's going on here? This isn't, uh, you know, you, you, you know. And I talked to the to the rep. He's like, oh no, this is a uh, Israeli grade this, and uh, you know, medical grade uh, uh, chemicals that. And I'm like, okay, that that sounds like it could mean something. And then I turn around and I ask my friend Harmon from Green Arrow. I was like, is this a thing? He's like, no, dude, those are just fucking talking bullshit. That's salesman crap. Yep. You know, that, that's not a thing. You know, and, uh, you know, luckily I've had people like that in my life, like Bob and, and Harmon, you know, and these people I've been able to throw, uh, you know, questions against. Otherwise I'd be just as lost as the guy at the store, you know, and they were so many different ridiculous choices. You know, um, it went from overpriced, uh, uh, single, you know, products like that, to you know, now it's these, you know, 27 different supplements, you know, with an NPK base, uh, you know, 15 different biostimulants, five different mycorrhizae, they're all in a liquid. You know, and, uh, you know, and y y the science just doesn't make sense. You know, it's like, what the shit, liquid mycorrhizae, that doesn't really work like that. Fungus doesn't like water. It doesn't yeah. live there. It does, it's very hard to keep it still. It'd be better to keep it in a powder, you know, and, and I just don't understand how someone can, you know, think that you need, you know, 18 different bottles of something to grow a single plant. That does not make sense. You know, that's a, you've been marketed to, it's a marketing gimmick, you know, and, and they did a fantastic job. I got it, you know, as a capitalist, I say, good for you, you know, but as a, as a farmer, I'm like, Hey man, fuck you. That, you know, <laughs> you know this is bullshit. You know, I, I bought that shit hook, line and sinker when in my twenties and I fucking spent way too much money on that stuff. I, I got the results that I wanted, but I only got the results that those were capable of, you know, which was great for that time. But you know, there was. As soon as I saw a first batch of water, you know, basically highly amended soil, you know, with a you know, with some guano teas and a couple of things, I was completely blown away, just completely blown away. And then I saw uh, my friend Nate here do it on a large scale, which I didn't think was possible or a larger scale than I thought it was ever capable of. And I was like, OK, I'm doing everything wrong here. I got to start back from day one and I got to start learning again because I obviously don't know as much as I think I do. You know, and, yeah, you got it. To take in you know your late 30s when you've been doing something for more than 10 years well i mean it's you know it's an industry with uh just a lot of snake oil being sold man i mean when there's that much money in, in the industry everybody's got a product and most of those products are just spins off of uh spins off of the same old salts that are sold to to ag farmers yep. um you know it's, it's interesting like there's a company uh that sells a finishing a finishing fertilizer let's say um and and it's labeled as like a point it's like a 0 0.5 0 0.3 0 0.2 but like the actual npk of that finishing fertilizer is it's astronomical i mean it's it's like a it's like a 0 30 40 or something like that and you know it's like like you're saying they just they take the same the same stuff and they put it in a different bag with a different number on it and uh you know i mean look at all the different nutrient companies that still exist but even the ones that have come and gone in the in the cannabis space it's 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 wild um yeah that's you know that's part of what drove me to, to making a soil that was so nutrient dense i got tired of it going to a store and having somebody try and sell me their their 14 nutrient programs like, oh well you know, you got this bottle does this and this bottle does that. And this bottle, you know, this is your humic, your humix and this is your kelp and this is your calcium and your magnesium. And it just got it got daunting. I was like, well, I mean, let's just put it all in the soil and see what happens. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's a great example. CalMag. Uh, when I first started working at the hydro store, CalMag was in the fertilizer already. And then sometime while I was working there, they pulled it the hell out and put it in a bottle for 28 bucks. What the shit was that? It was all marketing. They could have put it in with the food. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, it, with, when you're dealing with chemicals, that shit will absolutely mix in there. There's no reason for a second bottle. Add the magnesium and the calcium to your chemicals. Why the shit would you add that separately? It's crazy. But that was, that was like you said, it's all marketing and profiteering. Yeah. Well, Genius uh, marketing. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, hey, let's face it. These guys get paid millions of dollars to figure out how to fleece us. They do, and they did. 
And they do. Yeah. <laughs> they continue to. This whole inflation thing is bullshit. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Let's all right, let's not go there. Let's let's yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it just comes down to like, you know, just education. It's like what yeah. you're doing with this podcast, yeah. Layton, and you know, what what Elaine's doing with her soil food web classes and and what you know what a lot of people in the space are are trying to pivot towards is just like educate your customer base you know because an educated customer can make informed choices and can make smart decisions that are better not only for their own bottom line but you know better better for the environment uh better for the people consuming their products um better for the people selling their products i mean that's the thing i'm hearing now out of california you know all these gardeners over the last year two years three years are switching over to these pure salt formulas running in rockwool and uh, they're running into serious problems with shelf life of their product you know, a guy buys 100 pounds of some killer looking stuff. Four months later, he's down to, you know, he's got 40 pounds left, except all the terpenes are gone and it's starting to turn brown. You know, but that fucking outdoor he got up in Humboldt, he bought 500 pounds of that and it still smells as good as the day he got it. Yeah. You know, I, and you're seeing this more and more, these these uh, systems where you're growing it with pure chemicals and no biostimulants and no organic carbons and no organic additives. They produce a, a shelf life that is a third to half of what you get out of even you know, a biosynthetic line, which is half of what you get out of a good organic line, you know, and if you're going to be growing on a large scale and you want your product to keep on the shelf and you want to be able to sell hundreds of pounds at a time and grow as much as you can and sell it when it counts, when those markets are hot, you're not going to be able to do that with a, a strict petrochemical line. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And Josh, I know you've seen it being in uh, the retail space of, of that end of things. And I've seen it from being in and out of stores, but you know, it's so fascinating to see kind of like the hot new product come in and take over the market space mm -hmm. and get used until like the next product that's better comes out or maybe it's just better marketed and kind of takes over the market space. And, you know, we've, we've kind of like run the gamut of liquid nutrients. And now we've kind of gone into this space of like salt, salt based nutrients, dry nutrient blends. Um, you know, and the one credit that I'll give the salt nutrient companies is that, you know, at least they're, they're taking the water out of the equation. Right. So like, it's kind of less in terms of like shipping and, and uh, trucking stuff around. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm partly surprised that like people just aren't going to, uh, you know, ag distributors and saying, Hey, just like mix these for myself, you know, like, and mix, mix me this blend. They Instead are of with very, very nice of yeah. bags and like, you know, kind of going through that process and, and you know, being the consumer on that level. Um, but I do think you're right, man. I mean, people are, are realizing that the shelf life isn't as good. You know, the terpene profiles aren't as good. Um, there's just something a little bit louder and a little bit more beautiful about some flower that, you know, who's grown in, grown in some OG soil, grown with, with humates and carbon and fulvix and, you know, um, like aminos, nitrogen sources with the fish oil. I mean, you know, all of that. So, and this is not unique to cannabis. This is the shelf life of all, all produce. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why the tomato from Safeway goes bad in four days, and the one you get at the farmer's market doesn't. Yep. Or the taste between the uh, the big giant strawberries yeah. that are grown and uh, commercially. You mean lack of taste? <laughs> <laughs> the ones that taste like water. <laughs> the taste of those versus the taste of like uh, you know stuff that you're getting from a farmer's market. Stuff that a that a farmer that's focused on biology and focused on plant bricks is, you know, and focused on mineral content is, is just bringing a better tasting, more quality product. Uh, and yeah, that's what it's all about, man. You know, and I think the other big limiting factor right now is money. Like if, if people, if money wasn't an issue, of course they would go buy the organic, right? But mm -hmm. organic got raped and, and stripped away, you know, like the word woke. Uh, yeah. And now it's, 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 yeah. oh, what's organic? Well, organic, but what did you use? How did you grow it? Right. Mm -hmm. It started at, oh, well, it's okay to be 15% inorganic and still label yourself organic. That was the first jump into Whole Foods. Then it was like, oh, well, as long as it's 49% inorganic and 51% organic, then it's still organic, right? No, it's not. It's, it's again, a watered down version of the original. But yeah, what you guys speak is truth, man. I mean, whether it be cannabis or any other plant, if it's grown biologically, holy shit, is it night and day. And, you know, I, I 
didn't realize how true that statement was until I started doing the regen conference and I'd go to these places and people would get me smoked up with this stuff that they had grown regeneratively organically. Mm -hmm. And it was night and day. My throat didn't burn friggin. I didn't get greasy fucking tar in my teeth. And you know, it was, and it was pleasure. The high was longer lasting, more uh, uplifting and less, you know, groggy. And I've been spoiled ever since, man. I can't even smoke the shit at dispensaries anymore. And, it, you know, because, because I've adjusted to this stuff that, that is night and day, I wish we had more opportunity, like especially in the dispensaries, for them to carry some regeneratively grown organic flour so that people could see and taste the difference. But the, the let's face it, the, the dispensaries are just – an end product of, of an industry that doesn't really give a shit. It's more about volume and pushing it out than it is about quality and, and especially like medicinal. I mean, that pisses me the fuck off when these guys are like, Oh, well, this is medicine grown. How exactly? It's not medicine. It's fucking it's McDonald's for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I could go on a rant about that, but yeah, you know, nope. That I think was the most disgusting part about the 2000s and the, all of those fertilizers that came out as medical marijuana fertilizers. Bunch of fucking scumbags taking advantage of sick people. Yep. It drove me fucking nuts. I, I just couldn't stand it. I, it the, the, my standard medical marijuana patient uh, program was a bag of rainbow grow, a bag of rainbow bloom, a bag of dirt, and some seaweed. You know, it's simple as can be. Away you go. Until we had products like Nate Soil, where you could just here's your bag of dirt, here's a bottle of Full Power, that's all you need. Yep. Well, I mean, there's more you want, but this is all you need. And if you run out of Full Power, you can just use water. It'll be okay. You know, if you need more food, top dress. Add a little bit of that dirt on the top. You know, if you make good dirt, if you make good compost, all you need is a little bit more on the top. If you're lacking. No, that is so true. So true. And again, it, you know, it's that taking advantage of, of people, especially people that are in need. Mm -hmm. And that's the sin, you know, that's where the real sin is. But, uh, yeah, it's easier to go to a, oh, I'm sorry, Nate, did I interrupt? No, go ahead, go ahead. It, it's easier to go to a petrochemical company and say, okay, I got this killer label. I want to come out with, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, name the rapper. I'm, I'm going to use his name. And I'm going to come up with the fertilizer. You know, and, uh, you know, we wanted, uh, you know, a grow, a bloom, a biostimulant line, you know, and we're going to, you know, put in, you know, $20 million and we're going to have it in every store in the country. You know, it's easier to do that than it is to start up a regenerative organic uh, a program where you're promoting good compost or good soils or good biostimulants. It's a lot harder to do. It takes years longer. The profit's way smaller. It's not about the profit. It's about what you get out of what you're doing. So true. And you know what? Um, Ken, add that question to the list. Um, and then, Nate, what were you going to try to pop in on? Uh, it, it slipped my mind. Um, yeah. I, I you know, Well, here, uh, here's, here it is. Um, you know, and I do think that, like, I think not all of it was necessarily or is necessarily predatory. I mean, I do think that there's just, like, a, like you know, miseducated customer base, mis miseducated salesmen um you know even from a dispensary level where they're cranking it out and they're just trying to fill a void it's like the customer doesn't even know you know they yeah. just want they want flour you know a lot of times they just want to see high percentages of thc and you know they're not concerned as much about growing practices or don't you know they, they don't think twice about it and that's where i just think like the kind of the educational aspect of it is important you know and there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat out there. You know, I mean, people growing cocoa and salts, you know, I saw a couple, you know, a couple, couple things pop up from one of the guys um, making some comments about, you know, don't hate on the cocoa boys or like storing your organic flour and plastic is, you know, isn't great either. And it's like, yeah, there's, there's a lot in the industry that kind of like needs to be more well-rounded. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to, to grow flour, man. Um, but, you know, ultimately, when you're if you were to take that cocoa approach with basic agriculture and kind of do it on the landscape, I mean, dude, you're going to just cause polluted waterways and just bombed out, bombed out soil. I mean, it won't even be soil. It's just going to be dirt. It's going to be dead. It's going to be lifeless. Every um, golf course in the country. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I just think I, I can't stress enough, like, you know, and, and, you know, that's kind of like one of the things that I've been doing with, with my company is just trying to like, trying to just like educate the customer base. You know, I don't want to like off put people by, you know, by talking down to anybody. I just, you know, do a little bit of research. I encourage everybody to like look into the soil food web and encourage everybody to look in how fertilizers are produced. And uh, yeah, I think there's just, there's better ways to do things. And we as humans should always kind of be looking on how to kind of do the best that we can with making the, the most, you know, the little impact that we can in, in terms of our environment. So. Yeah. Well put. Nick. Well put. Absolutely. And, and you know, I need to, uh, take a minute and give you some kudos because for you to jump into the soil industry in 20 2020 clearly takes big balls either that or you didn't understand what you were doing <laughs> i think you understood what you were doing but a little bit man. the 2020 like you know i didn't think that covid was gonna like happen and then shut down supply lines and you know, make costs skyrocket. I mean, I knew that there were probably more ideal times to start the soil business. Like I had been entertaining it, you know, for about a decade. And uh, it was just, you know, gardening was more of my like project of passion. And, you know, that was all making soil. And then it kind of became one of those things where I had peers that were seeing what I was producing in the soil I was making. And they they wanted to to have those same results. And you know, started with me being like, hey, like, you know, here's a soil recipe, check it out. But not many people want to go through the process of making their own soil and taking the time to do it right. Um, so I just kind of started selling soil on the side, man. And we, we literally started, uh, you know, before 2020, um, I was making it mostly for myself and a few peers and a few farms. And I was doing it in my driveway and it was me and a buddy and we were using the tarps and shovels and my two car garage had been converted into like nutrient storage. And, um, you know, now we've kind of scaled up to where we're in like a 30,000 square foot warehouse and um, it still has its challenges. Like, as as you know, like I could tell by your your uh, wholesome laugh there about it, like it's it's a tough thing to be in. And especially when you're concerned about creating the best product possible it's extremely tough to be in um but it's uh i'm passionate about it and i i appreciate the recognition recognition that you've given it Layton. oh my my pleasure i mean I, I, you got you gotta give somebody a compliment when it's deserved and so you know again kudos to you for for taking that bull by the horns and going for it so how are you doing financially in in this year how are you doing well, I mean, you know, we we had a lot of trouble here, probably at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, you know, because Oregon was going to change their laws and start implementing um, heavy metal testing and implementing um, uh, more well, like biological testing, I, I guess. They're more mildew testing, mold testing. I mean, there was always botrytis testing, but basically they were going to start testing for uh for for pm um and for us the heavy metal was of large concern because i'm sure as you know with your work in the organic agriculture space that a lot of organic material has a lot of heavy metals in it now not to say that that's all bad but the testing in oregon was uh particularly precarious because the thresholds of action were so low so for flour in the state of Oregon to be sold, your action level is, or your detection limit is uh, 0.2 parts per million. So to put that into perspective, a state like Colorado, let's say for something like arsenic, uh, arsenic is what I refer to the most because I find it's the most abundant in organic, in organic agriculture and organic things. Um, so that like the the, the limit in Colorado, and I think Washington is the same, it's about 10 parts per million. So the limit for Oregon, and I think Oregon is the same as California, is 0.2 parts per million. Um, so in the beginning of 2022, we started working with some farms in Oregon, and they started testing their flour for us. And we were using the California threshold as our guideline for like what is and what isn't allowable. Um, we realized very quickly that our soil was mostly making it that our farms would fail all the time. 
Um, not fail by a lot, you know, if you're looking at like the Colorado threshold of 10 parts per million, like we were far under that. I mean, our, our highest levels that I think we were seeing were about like 0.4 parts per million, um, which was still double what the Oregon law was going to be. So that was causing huge problems for us. So that kind of sent us into a tailspin, um, and just sent us scrambling all through 2022 to uh figure out like where are heavy metals coming from how do we mitigate this so you know i started testing all of our inputs um i tested inputs that we use i tested inputs that we don't use i was testing peat rice hulls cocoa i was testing pumice tested perlite um all of the amendments that we use man just looking for the cleanest stuff and looking how can we reduce our load um in that process of changing our recipe, we are, our, uh, our recipe wasn't quite hitting the mark the way that I wanted it to. Um, and we were also really concerned kind of coming up into 2023, like, are we gonna meet this deadline? When we're creating a product that takes, you know, six to eight weeks to make, and then it gets sold, and then a farm has to go through an eight to 10 week cycle to grow it, to use it, let their flour dry, to test it, get the results back from the laboratory. I mean, we were looking at, gosh, what is that, like five months, six months yeah, maybe, for us to get that data back? Um, so it was a slow process. Um, and then towards the end, as the data was coming in at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, we had to make some quick decisions. But but ultimately, we were able to reduce our nutrient load uh, or not nutrient load, excuse me, our heavy metal load um, from from what our soil was, which was about three parts per million, like 3.5 parts per million of, uh, like I said, using arsenic as our, as our main problem one, we reduced that down to about 0.5 to 0.75 parts per million. Um, since we've done that, we haven't had any rec farms fail. We were able to get the recipe straightened out pretty much right before the, uh, right before the new regulations came in. So as the laws got put into place, we rolled out the new soil, um, you know, at the end of 2022. Um, and yeah, we haven't had any fails. Everything's been running smoothly. Um, the business has been more profitable and we've gotten more customers um, because we've been, you know, true to creating this product that's been helping the cannabis farms in the state of Oregon succeed and be able to succeed organically, uh, which I don't think that there were a lot of companies out there that were doing the R&D that we were doing to kind of like help our customers. Because if we were going to sell a soil that had our customers failing, we were going to go out of business because that that is our customer base. Our It's majority rec farms. Like we do sell in retail stores. We have hobby growers that use it. Um, but for the most part, I mean, if we don't have those rec accounts, then then we would be floundering. Mm -hmm. uh, that coupled with just, you know, inflation, <laughs> like you said, don't want to go there, but inflation was definitely a real thing. Transportation costs over the past few years. It's made it difficult to survive in this space. Um, but right now I'm feeling more confident about it than I have since I've started the business. Um, and now it's just about getting the word out about our product and, uh, you know, just just trying to make it happen. I mean, I'm, I'm really thankful for the people that are using the product. I'm really thankful for like Josh, who's been a great advocate for our product and, you know, getting some farms out there to, to jump onto our, uh, jump onto our soil. And um, Hell, I've, uh, I've helped uh, quite a few farms by switching them over to Nate soil over, uh, uh, you know, either soilless mixes or other highly amended soils that just weren't cutting the mustard, you know, and uh, I haven't found another, I've used just about every brand name, highly amended soil that's available on the West coast and uh, I haven't found anything that even comes close to uh, the quality I get out of using organic matter soil. Well, that's a true testament to you, Nate, for, for doing the, the hard work, the R&D stuff to get out of the curve, so to say, uh, before the law enacted. So uh, well-deserved victory, my friend, well-deserved. Um, so let me ask you this. I'm sure the audience would love to hear this. Um, in your uh, research, what did you find were some of these leading sources of uh, heavy metals uh, as in the inputs? Here we go. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was definitely a variety of stuff. Some stuff, I assume. Some of the surprising was, ones, Nate. The ones uh, that oh, Yeah, so some stuff I assume was going to be high. Um, there were some things that were far higher than I thought. You know, I had always heard that like kelp was high in arsenic. 
Um, kelp did turn out to be high in arsenic, kind of so high that we had to stop using it. And we were getting really good quality kelp coming out of the North Atlantic. Um, and I guess kind of before I delve into this, I, I just want to kind of put this disclaimer out here that like the threshold for testing in Oregon, I believe that it's too low. Like it is unrealistically low. So as I say that these products are high in these heavy metals, I don't want the audience out there to think that like, oh, I should stay away from kelp or I should stay away from these things. Um, this is more just, you know, a little education on based on what I saw and what the changes I had to make were for our situation. Um, but like I said, you know, before we reduced our, our arsenic load down to about 0.5 parts per million, uh, it was at 3.5 or three parts per million. And that wasn't high. I mean, that's relatively low in terms of like the amount of a heavy metal to have in soil. So I don't think our soil was a problem before. I don't think that the, that the cannabis that was grown in our soil was unsafe to smoke. So um, I, I'll continue now with kind of some of the other things. But, but kelp was high. Um, we used a generous amount of crab meal. I really like crab meal. It's a good source of chitin. It's a good source of nitrogen, good source of calcium. Um, a good source of a lot of different aminos. Um, but crab meal was something that we used pretty heavy, but crab meal ended up being too high for us to use, which was really problematic for us because it was one of our main nitrogen sources. So we had to make the switch from crab meal to shrimp meal. And luckily the shrimp meal that's out, out here on the Oregon coast comes from like a small, like North Pacific shrimp um they have shorter life cycles they're smaller they don't accumulate heavy metal as much as uh as like the dungeness do that we were using um so that was really helpful to mitigate our heavy metals um some of the rock dust that we were looking at i was like really really shocked to see how high some heavy metals were there's one company out there that's got a rock dust that's that's so high that i i wouldn't even say it's safe to use and you know in regular agriculture if you're using it in mass i mean it was high and it was a domestic source of rock dust um and really bummed me out because it was a it was a hard rock phosphate it was something that i was kind of looking forward to switching to because currently we use a an indonesian sourced seabird guano but it's <coughs> that the indonesian seabird guano is uh far lower in heavy metals than uh than the domestic rock phosphate um, that was pretty shocking for me. Uh, another thing that, uh, that was really a, a tough pill to swallow in terms of heavy metals for us was worm castings. Um, not all worm casting sources are pretty equal. Depending on what the farm is feeding their worms really dictates kind of what is coming out of the worm castings. Um, you know, for us in 2022, 2021, we started producing our own worm castings in-house using African night crawlers. Um, we had a really good source of worm bedding. Bedding is what they eat through and, and live in and ultimately turns into a casting. Um, we were producing very high quality castings and it turned out that the castings that we had, uh, that we were making and using were too high in, uh, too high in arsenic for us to use in our soil. And that's basically because that bedding source, which was like a reed, a type of reed sedge peat was just contaminated with arsenic from the ground. Um, so, I mean, man, through 2021 and 2022, I, I was working on, you know, beta testing a kind of a small worm facility to eventually do a larger worm facility. Um, and definitely got the wind taken out of my sails when I had to like scrap that whole project uh, because we couldn't find a food source that was low enough in heavy metals for us to use. Um, so we, we did find a, a good source of worm castings that was lower in arsenic. And, and again, like not to say that the castings that we were producing were like, you know, obscenely high in heavy metals. It, it's just it was too high for the application that we were trying to use. And we use too much worm casting in the soil um, for us to to kind of like cut cut back, and that being our only compost source, like really we uh, yeah we we needed the worm casting, so we we had to set it we had to set aside all of that, and we had to uh, we had to use a, a different source, but worm yeah. casting were another big one. I think that Josh has a <clears throat> plane to catch here pretty soon. There's one question I want to get to. 
um, before he does have to fly. Uh, mm -hmm. Can't find Bioag complete uh, complete line anywhere online. You should sell it off your website. Uh, isn't not on your website? No, it is not. Uh, we okay. have some resellers on uh, uh, the Amazon, but if you want to find a place that has, there's two places you can find our entire uh, line online. One of them is called Concentrates. They're out of Milwaukee, Oregon, and they have got a good online store. And they'll sell you anything anywhere in the country. The other one is Spare Time Supply in California, Willits, California. They also have an online store and they sell our products anywhere in the country. You know, we're um, actually working with a gentleman in New Jersey right now to get our uh, customers over there on the East Coast a much better deal uh, on shipping. And uh, he's uh, actually started selling our products last year. I don't know the name of his uh, uh, his online store off the top of my head. I, th I believe it's called Hydro to You. Uh, but uh, I will double check that and I'll uh, let uh, uh, Ken know uh, so we can uh, uh, let you guys know at a later date. Cool. Ken, maybe you can uh, pull up those two resources and just uh, flash them in the bar so that uh, the audience can uh, pull from it if they oh, want. Oh, sure. I didn't write them down, Layton. Lily, did you write those down? You can put them in the, in the chat, please. Concentrates in Milwaukee, Oregon, and yeah, Spare Time Supply in Willits, California. The uh, the website for concentrates is like concentratesnw.com. Yeah. Concentratesnorthwest.com. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the spare time website is, but. Uh, if you Google spare time, they'll pop up. They've been around forever. Yeah. They're they're just, uh, there. Concentrates might be a little more obscure. Yes. And um, um, Joshua, so you have to leave in 45 minutes or less? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I got to take off here in about uh, about a half an hour, 45 minutes. All right. Cool. So we do have some more time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so backing into a uh, better understanding of betting, and I think this is really, really important for the audience to understand, is that a lot of uh, worm casting beddings are a source, are manure sourced. So whether it be horse manure or cow manure. Mm -hmm. And the thing that people don't understand um, what's going on is that the feed industries are part of the elites. And they use a lot of heavy metals, i.e. aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, you name it, to increase the weight of their food so that they're selling you uh, less of the protein that costs them so much and more of the shit that you don't want uh, just to make more money. Now, not only is that bad uh, for for us humanity it's not so bad for the animals because the animals can't uptake it so the animals just concentrate it and then poop it out whereas the worms actually consume it or how do i say this uh encapsulated in the castings so if you're using horse manure or cow manure um in your bedding that's where those metals are coming from and, it, and it's a huge issue so you know again like in a perfect world, you don't, you make your own bedding. You use your own compost, you use your straw, you supply it with the feedstocks, you, you know, your organic vegetables or, you know, whether you go to a restaurant or a college or whatever to, to get their food scraps. Now you've got a win-win where you don't have to worry about it. And the one other piece that's really important to understand is that there is what's called bioavailable and non-bioavailable. And what I mean by that is you can have very high levels of arsenic, but as long as they're not bioavailable, they can't be uptaken. Mm -hmm. How do you prevent them from being bioavailable? Well, this gets into a realm of what we call quantum entanglement, for lack of better words. It's basically using electrons, electron donors, electron sharers, um, and, and, and electron uh, uh donors. So if you're using the right biology, the biology will actually do the work for you. Um, they, through i.e. biochemical geo interactions or reactions, will actually tie those things up and make them non-bioavailable. Um, I'm working with a company right now, uh, Ecosphere Sciences, where we're just getting ready to delve into that, um, how to tie up heavy metals. And the question is, well, the metals are still there. And, and it's like, yeah, so you know how much arsenic is everywhere around us? Fuck yeah. of arsenic, everywhere. Well, why isn't it killing us? Because it's not bioavailable. And this is where, you know, I, I agree with you, Nate. Like, they've taken it so fucking far, it's not funny, that 
if you tested anything you bought, even at fucking Whole Foods, the way they test cannabis, you couldn't eat any of it. No, you wouldn't eat a thing. No. Not yeah. at all. Right. I, I can tell you for a fact that the thresholds in the ag world for food are nowhere even in the realm of what they test cannabis. And there is, there's not another crop, whether you're talking about food that we eat or the plants that they grow for our medicine. Do you think the guy growing poppy for making Vicodin legal in our country and and, and uh, the opiates that we use for our medicine, do you think he has a tag on every plant? Do you think the state is watching him through a camera and he have heavy metal tests every crop? No, he doesn't have to do any of that, but we do. Yeah, it was. It, it's, again, the, the elites putting a kibosh on something that, we all desperately need. We all have an endocannabinoid system. We all grew up. We evolved with this plant. All our animals that we ate ate hemp as a mainstay. So we were getting our can cannabinoids through default from the chickens that put it in the eggs, from the cows that we ate the steak or hamburger from, the pigs that we eat the bacon from. All of those were loaded with cannabinoids that, because that's what that plant provided for that animal. And so when they took the way hemp, uh, DuPont motherfuckers <laughs> wanted to get the rope contract with the Navy, Yep. Uh, started the whole process and then took it to, to the next level to the point where farmers were threatened. They would land would be taken away. If any, even friggin' native, uh, hemp plants were found on their property. So what did the farmers do? Burned it all, fucking killed it crushed it, nuked it with fucking herbicides mm -hmm. just so that they didn't lose their property. And that was pretty much the end of humanity or at least Americans health. I mean, you go to Europe, man, you don't have these kinds of problems over there. Um, you know, I, I've been to Greece and, and the food was just insane how good it was. And I kept asking these people like, well, why is it so much better? And they would laugh because they're like, well, we're not stupid like you Americans. We, we don't use shit that you use and we don't, we can't afford to buy the crap that you buy. So our stuff is all done by default organically and regeneratively. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we hate to say it, but we kind of need a fucking revolution, man. We got to drain the swamp and get rid of these fucking career politicians that have literally sold us yes. to the pharmaceutical, the fucking petroleum, big ag, Big fertilizer, all of those guys. They sold us. Yeah. And I mean, if you, take, if you take money out of politics and you put term limits in Congress, I think that that would solve a majority of, majority of the problems. Yeah. No, they should not be able to inside trade. A well, prime they example, should. England just confiscated a shipment of Mountain Dew and Jolly Ranchers headed for the UK. And you know why? Because <laughs> it's fucking poison and they won't sell it to their people. Well, it's also when, when when those countries over there, you know, when they have sick people, they're paying for the bill. Like over here, we're paying for our own bills when we get sick. So it's a system of like, you know, we buy the poison and then we buy the medicine. Where yep. over there, you know, it's a uh, socialized medicine. So well, yeah, they don't they don't let you buy the poisons. <laughs> yeah. No yeah, if you follow where there's petrochemicals used on a large scale anywhere in the world you'll see the cancer rates triple or more every single place without exception and you can follow it through history and you can watch as cancer grows with the use of petrochemicals specifically nitrogen you know it, it's everywhere it, it's undeniable the facts are there they just don't advertise it they just don't explain to it but all the information is out there you just got to look it up well and you know Leighton, it's like you said man it's like the hypocrisy of of what's going on here where we at a level of, of cannabis farmers are being subjected to this type of testing that, you know, big ag is not not being subjected to. I mean, it just it seems diabolical. I mean, it really just seems like they're trying to make it hard as hard as possible for the little person to, like, grow some cannabis for themselves, have a little family business. Um, they're making it difficult. And I have no problem with with testing of pesticides or the testing of heavy metals. I, I think all of that stuff should be tested, but I would like to see reasonable thresholds. And I would also like to see everything be tested. I would like you to see are. all the food in grocery stores be tested for pesticides. Mm -hmm. All the stuff in grocery stores be tested for mycotoxins. All of it be tested for heavy metals. I mean, that would be great, but that's never going to happen because like you said, I mean, those heavy metals, A, they're abundant everywhere and everything all around us. And then 
B, a lot of those heavy metals are being, you know, put into things from, you know, from big business. Mm -hmm. Not to mention chemtrails, right? <laughs> <laughs> don't get him started. Oh, man. don't get him started. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's not open that can of worms. Oh, man. Well, you know, at, at this point in time, you almost have to because it's all connected, right? So the level of aluminum has gone through the fucking roof in the last 10 years, right? And everyone's like, oh, yeah. well, the, the, how can you have a thousand parts per million aluminum in the soil on, on you know, some of these mountaintops? Yeah, yeah well, well, when free yeah. aluminum shouldn't even, like, exist in nature, right? Like, like molecularly, like, free aluminum isn't something that should be... No, it's existed. locked up in the minerals. Yeah, uh, they. I can't remember which ag crop. I believe it was uh, an apple crop of, of one type. It has a problem with accumulating uh, 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 aluminum. And uh, uh, we've been working with farms in uh, Washington on dealing with that and some of the different diseases in the apple industry. And a lot of these ones that accumulate too much aluminum, they got to throw them away. You know, and uh, uh, we've actually helped them with, uh, uh, with several different humate based products uh, to remediate uh, the aluminum going into the apples by more than 30%. You know, but the, all of that is because these trees, they've been around so long pulling up aluminum out of the ground that the amount of aluminum in there is off the freaking chart. Yep. Yep. And you know, but where did it come from? You know, right. it's yeah. the same place where the reason why they find plastic bags in the bottom of the, uh, the deepest parts of the ocean. You know, they find plastic beads all the way through all the Great Lakes. You know, those micro bead things that are from uh, people's uh, uh, whatever lotions and whatnot. You know, I, they're everywhere, you know. Find yeah. a way to clean those up and clean up the mistakes of the past that was done purely for predatory profit. Well, the, I think the good news is that no matter what we do to this planet, we're only killing ourselves. It'll yeah. come. It, it'll come right back. No fucking problem. Yeah. Once the reset button gets hit, I mean, it'll yep. just yeah. It'll bounce it'll, back. And it'll come back more diverse than ever. Give it ten thousand, fifty thousand years, and that's nothing. That's a fucking wink of the eye in geological time. It's just to it's, it's humanity's its own worst enemy, but mm -hmm. that's a that's a little bit off of the topic of today. But <laughs> well, uh, it all ties back into uh, 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 petrochemicals. You know, I you know where are petrochemicals produced? You know, most nitrogen is produced in Germany. Where do they produce that from? That comes from natural gas. Well, where does Germany get natural gas? They don't have natural gas. They get it all from Russia. Yep. So that means you're buying that chemical nitrogen. Not only are you paying the chemical companies, you're paying Russia. And a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where it comes from. I, uh, I did a presentation back probably 10 years ago on, on understanding how many gallons of oil it takes to make one bag of fertilizer. And it was a 55-gallon drum. And that doesn't include transportation. No. 55 gallon drum of this shit to make one 25 pound bag of fertilizer. And if you add up what it costs to get it over here, it's like a barrel and a half. And, and you know, the problem is that not only is it been converted into something that we both, we all know is, is very poisonous to the environment and to us, but it could have been used in so many other beneficial ways. Like I can't wait I'm not going to be alive to see it. I don't believe, but I can't wait till the till the bacteria that consume plastic evolve, because there's literally everything: our cars, our houses, our clothes, our footwear, everything that around us has plastic in it. Could you imagine if a super plastic eater got loose? <laughs> We'd be all walking around naked. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, and they're working on making those new uh, uh, solubilizing plastic uh, bacteria all over the place. You know, oh, one of them's going to escape. You know, one of them's going to get out there. Oh, hell yeah. Well, let's face it. They cultured them from the plastic island in the Pacific. Yeah. So they're already out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go there. But no worries. <laughs> I got a question here I need to answer really quick. Uh, to answer your question, it was spare time supply in California that carries all the bioag line. Spare time no. supply. They're in Willits, California. There you go. Normally, a kennel flashing up, but he sounds like he's a little busy behind the scenes today. And if you can't um, get it there, talk to our friends at Bayside. Lily's better at, at spelling than I am, so I try to let her to tackle those ones, you know. 
Well, thanks, Ellie. Thanks for your work behind the scenes, sweetie. Um, Always appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, another interesting thing that you, you started talking about is, is like aluminum buildup uh, and some of these other heavy metal buildups. And um, yeah, one of the great things is, is, is humates and, and humic and fulvic um, acids are, are just incredible. Like for years I've been telling cannabis growers cause I used to be on FPC and that was really cannabis, you know, dedicated. Yeah. We did pull in some, some people, but usually got repercussion as a result of it. Um, but it was always the, the, the rescue, right? The rescue yeah. was always humic acid to get your chemistry in balance, mm -hmm. fish brew to get your biology in balance. Mm -hmm. And if you're not being tested, freaking kelp to get your plant hormones. And if mm -hmm. you hit all three of those things, I don't care what your grow is doing, it will turn around. Yep. Like I had people hit me up this spring, two different farmers, cannabis growers, mm -hmm. showing me their chemistry tests. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, these, these plants should be potassium toxic. You're, you're, everything is flipped way the fuck upside down. You got 65% potassium and like 20% calcium. Like that, 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 that can't work. <laughs> They'd be like, no, let me show you, let me show you. And I'd see pictures of the plants and the leaves were praying and everything was green. And I'm just like, all right, what the fuck are you doing? What else are you doing that you're not telling me about? And every, both of them said the same thing. Oh, I use, I use uh, Biolag's uh, uh, full humic. Yeah. Uh, it's a week, mm -hmm. right? So there's the answer, guys. There's the answer for everything. Is if you have metals issues, or you have a chemistry imbalance, if you're using humic acid, it will do that beautiful symphony that that allows chemistry to be way out of whack, but still function. And I don't know how to explain that. Like I asked Bob that. Uh, Bob, Bob, and I hit it off. I don't know, probably eight years ago. Um, that conferences that I put on and we went down the fucking rabbit hole hard. Like that guy's super intelligent. But that that. One thing that he couldn't answer was like, why? why, why is it that it can be so far out of whack and still put things? Work. Yeah. it still work. I mean, have, has there been any further research on? on uh, we're still looking into that. We, we actually, uh, in, uh, 2020, because, uh, uh, we, you know, there were no trade shows to go to and there wasn't a lot to do. We ended up investing a, a huge amount in uh, studies all over the world for different ag crops, you know, with different universities, uh, uh, violin research up in Canada, you know, uh, Rachel Zellner uh, uh, with Silica, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, we're still uh, uh, discovering why these things are, are uh, uh, doing what they're doing. But the results are uh, amazing. You know, it's uh, remediating huge amounts of uh, uh, aluminum and different heavy metals, either uh, getting them to stay uh, stable in the uh, root zone or uh, remediating them into the stock. But uh, uh, but the biology, how it's getting everything to work in the soil uh, symbiotically while other things are so far off, uh, we don't have a definitive answer on that yet. You know, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of those results with all sorts of different crops all over the planet. I mean, we're selling uh, humic acid now from everywhere from South America to Guam, uh, Asia, and, uh, and now we're one of our biggest uh, spots that we've had uh, the greatest luck is in the uh, livestock uh, uh, in Europe. You know, Bioag Europe, one of their biggest things is uh, selling humates uh, for uh, livestock and uh, large production, and they're having fantastic results in uh, creating cleaner, healthier, uh, happier uh, livestock. You know, like I mentioned, uh, uh, the gentleman, uh, German Tom, and his uh, uh, very large no-till uh, uh, farm, uh, you know, most of the bioag products, he's uh, not uh, adding those to his composties. He's feeding them to his pigs. He let them go through the pigs first, you know, and then he's adding, uh, you know, fulvic acid to the compost to help wake up the microbes. But the microbes were already created by running it through the pig, you know, in the particular way that he makes his compost piles and his uh, pig pen. Yeah, it's you know, it's a fascinating process. I'll uh, uh, send you some uh, info on it. And I'll try to connect you with Tom. Fantastic. I'd love, love that. Guy. So, yeah, one of the um, interesting things was we had a woman on the show, uh, I think six months ago, um, who was making uh, fulvic acid for human consumption. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I've been swearing to people for years, like, you know, I'll make a compost tea and drink it. And, and because I understand the value of those humic and fulvic acids that are, you know, not, not nature's made. And then they are incredibly powerful. I mean, people don't understand like 
the folic acid will literally go into the cell. It's, it's atomic waste is so small that it's 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 consumable by anything and everything. And what she she brought on to our attention was just that was that when added to feed for animals, the health of the animal increased exponentially. The cost of the vets went down. Um, the animal increased its wheat uh, or its weight yields, so you had a better meat production. And overall, the animal was more healthy and happy in in its environment. So, you know, there's a big thing to that. And I, so, I'm really impressed that that guy, for whatever reason, realized that feed, feeding the, your product to the pigs first is actually more beneficial than it would be if to just use it straight on the soil. That's yeah, freaking fantastic. At Bioag, we actually have a human consumption line, and uh, the uh, the human consumption version of Full Power is called Wu Jin Sun. And do not ask me to spell it because I do not know how. <laughs> oh come on! But if you go online and you look up, uh, 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 again, I'll try to provide Ken with uh, links and information on this down the road when I have more information on it because uh, that is again not my section of Bioag, but there is a full section from Bioag that involves using our products for humans. Be it, uh, be it, uh, uh, you know, different types of, uh, I know Bob used to sell humate soaks for tubs. It was like a bath bomb that had yeah. humic acid, particularly for people with uh, a bad uh, 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 joints. You know, I know that uh, we, we've sold uh, quite a bit of Wujinsan to several different uh, health spas and places, any place where they serve wheatgrass, they seem to uh, serve a lot of uh, uh, some sort of a, a, a human consumption fulvic acid with it. Again, uh, I'm assuming it's for the same reason we uh, uh, feed fulvic acid with seaweed and other uh, benefits like uh, uh, alfalfa and other uh, beneficial uh, uh, additives. But, but again, uh, I'm I am not a doctor and I dare not pretend to be. <laughs> so Ken, there was a question at six sixteen uh, from Cake in a Cup about radon. Please tag that one. Ooh, radon. Um, radon gas. Yeah. yeah um, bad one. Yeah. So. So moving forward in, in the future, I've been working with um, a couple of your gentlemen there. Oh, God. I can't believe I just – I had their name on the tip of my tongue. I think he's the president or CEO. Who's your – Oh, who's Vic. Your, Vic and then uh, – ah. Vic and Bill. Uh, we, we had, uh, uh, there's a, uh, there's Vic, Bill, and, uh, uh, sometimes Bob and, uh, Jeff Lowenfeld is on our board of directors. No, it's, Bill. it's Bill. Definitely Bill. Yeah. Bill so, Riddle, our, he's kind of my opposite in ag. He does not yes, ag what I do in yes. Canada. Yes, that's it. So we recently ran a trial on Calmino nice. as a way to, um, clean off cation exchange sites. Mm -hmm. and I have not shared the data with them yet. I, I got super busy on a couple of projects over the last month and are starting to wind down a little so I can catch up on some of the research that I've been doing uh, cool. parallel. And a, a really interesting result because the three of us were brainstorming, well, because it's in an amino acid form, will it, will it bond to the cation exchange site or is it just like free? Is it free floating? Mm -hmm. It's going to just dissipate or be uptaken. So interestingly enough, it did bing, it did ding the friggin' uh, cation exchange sites, which is great. Um, but I think in the future, I, I would in in a situation where I have a really upset or off balance, and I and I need more calcium, that I'm probably going to do something like maybe one part gypsum, two or three parts quick lime, fuck up the pH, and then buffer the pH with with biology because that that was another trick. But I would also use some of the Calmino because um, I think that as a amino acid resource that it would provide a, a necessary interim step between um, the, the mineral for, I want to call the chemistry form and the biological interaction with the plant so that the plant gets buffered quickly with the calcium until the soil gets in tune. But uh, yeah, that was, that was something that I was hoping to, to get a little bit of time in. 
about some of the amino acid digest products that you've been bringing out. Yeah, uh, we've had some amazing uh, uh, results with the Calamino, uh, just feeding it on a regular basis to plants with different types of diseases, be it powdery mildew, plants outside dealing with botrytis, or even uh, the hard ones like tobacco mosaic virus or vexillium wilt. And we're not able to eliminate these diseases, but we're able to mitigate a huge amount of the symptoms to where they're still able to get a crop off and have a, a usable, sellable product that's still worth selling. Yeah. And and how are how are those being digested? Is that IP or uh, from what I understand, it's a, uh, there, there's two different ways you can do amino acids, you know, just like humates, you can do it, uh, you know, with chemicals and a chemical extraction or, uh, in a, uh, microbial, uh, a slow process, you know, with enzymatically digesting. And from what I understand, they, they, it's an enzymatically digested system that they use to make our aminos, but because it's that way and not chemically extracted, it doesn't make as stable of a liquid. You know, that makes uh, making the liquid a much more difficult process, which is why we have, it, have them mostly available in powders. But we are coming out with some liquids here in the near future now that we figured out a way to stabilize them uh, uh, without having to go way off the board with, again, hydroxides or other chemicals. Just, uh, you know, if we have to do something for shelf life, I just like to adjust the pH. You know, really, I, I don't want to have to go further than that. And if we do, you know, we, we really like to take our time with a product like that. You know, uh, that was one of the issues we had when he brought out our silica uh, our new nano structured silica was it worked fine in all its iterations, but the shelf life and its exposure to cold would make it so it wouldn't uh, uh, they, when you couldn't shake it up, it wouldn't remix together, you know, and uh, we kind of had to figure that out over the course of a year before we released it. Uh, uh, but it, it seems the uh, as a powder form and making it into a liquid. Uh, the results compared to the other products that we've compared it to that are you know identical but are produced uh, in other parts of Asia and uh, are uh, chemically extracted instead of microbial extracted or enzymatically extracted, uh, the, the difference is night and day. You know, uh, so many of those products, uh, you know, once you get into them and you start testing them, you're like, oh, this amino acids is a uh, you know an eighteen zero zero. You know, so this is really comparable to our fourteen zero zero or this uh, other one that's a ten zero zero. Not really, because when you look into their source of nitrogen, you find out that that's got calcium nitrate in it. You know, I so why are you, you know, I don't get me wrong. I like using amino acids and I see the benefit of it, but that nitrogen is being built up by the nitrate that you added to the mix, not, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the natural process, which is what you're trying to get out of using that product. Right. You know, and, and frankly, you know, a lot of these amino acid products over the years have been one of those dirty secrets in the cannabis industry where they, they take a couple of good quality amino acids from the ag world, mix it with some water, and now it's $80 a liter or, or even worse, $80 a cup in a nice metal can, you know, with a pretty label and you use one mil per gallon. Dude, you can make that with a pound of the powder, you know, and then you got to your own concentrate at your own house. You just got to raise the pH to eight after you mix it up real good for an, a half an hour. It's not hard to do, you know, and uh, one of the things I, I want to do here uh, uh, later this spring or summer when I get a free minute, oh, if I get a free minute, is I want to do some videos on how to convert uh, uh, bioag products from powder into liquid. You know, uh, we're actually coming out with a lot. Uh, all the powders that we have now are humate bases. We're coming out with liquid uh, alternatives for the uh, mostly for uh, commercial farms. They're not going to be available in quarts or, or gallons. They'll only be available in two and a half gallons and uh, giant 275s. But, we're, but we will have them available, you know, so uh, TM7, Cyto Plus, we've already got full Humix available. You know, all of those are going to be available in a stabilized liquid uh, that, uh, you know, will pass heavy metal tests and are easier to use in large doser systems and these larger commercial applications. Nice. As, as always, continuing to evolve as a responsible mm -hmm. business should. So. Absolutely. You know, it's a, with BioAg, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a million great ideas. It's just there's never enough time and there's never enough financing. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know that's that seems to be the issue. You know, I as soon as I get, a, a, you know, an extra million dollars, we're going to have a mycology lab and then I'll have some real cool stuff to come and show you. There you go. There you go. Well, it'll happen. It'll happen for sure. I mean, oh, yeah. you guys, have, you guys have made it this far. Uh, and continue to deliver good, solid products to the industry. So I don't see any chance that you're not going to continue to evolve and get to that place where you have finally have all the assets that you need. I mean, yeah. I just I remember where Bob came from and, and look at him now, right? He's retired. Exactly. Business is booming. So. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now he's happily retired. And every once in a while, I get to drag him out to do something fun. There you, know, you, like, go. Uh, uh, you know, Bob is actually dragging me to Hawaii in February. Good. 
Good. And, uh, we're going to go do the trade show out there and go talk to some uh, uh, macadamia nut farmers while we're there. Sweet. Awesome. That's yeah, fantastic. Time in Hawaii. Should be fun. Uh, Big Island, I assume? Uh, actually, the show is on Honolulu, and then we're going to go visit the Big Island after the show. Got you. Got you. Fantastic. Well, Nate, I didn't mean to cut you out of there, but I wanted to make sure we got oh, good, Joshua good. keyed up so that if he had to bounce, he could. Um, was there something you'd like to add? I'm going to him to the, I'm, I'm gonna take him to the airport. So when Oh, you're both there. bouncing. Okay. Yes, yes. But we still got about uh, 10 minutes here, so we still got a little bit of time. All we right. have some more questions. Yeah, that's where I was going to go next. Let's go ahead, Ken. Let's fire off these uh, six questions. See if we can rapid fire them and get them done in 10 minutes. Again, I can't find that one from Cake in a Cup. Sorry, but it was about radon, you were saying. Right, it was about radon, gas, and apples. So the answer is no. You don't have to worry about the apples actually taking up radon gas. And people need to understand radon gas is, yes, is it radioactive? Yes. yes. But it's a sister. So it's not. It's, it's already gone through at least one half-life, so it's nowhere near as toxic as they make it out to be. It's kind of like all this other fluff asbestos right oh asbestos yeah. siding oh we got a capsule no just leave it the fuck alone anyway mm -hmm. sorry next question <laughs> okay we got ghetto hippie are worm castings good top dressing of course that's yeah. probably the Absolutely. best way to use them if top dressed properly you know you don't want to add something that holds too much moisture to the top of your soil and put too much of it there so a good quarter of an inch half an inch absolutely do not put four inches of worm castings on top of your dirt. Yeah, you will, you will definitely create a mud bog. Less is more. I like this guy. <laughs> what, what, what's you saying, Layton? Don't be a moron? Don't be a moron. Don't be uh, yeah. a moron. <laughs> okay, that. so let's see here. Another one from Ghetto. Will silica and aloe vera juice enhance stem strength? Uh, silica absolutely will. I've, I've seen some pretty cool results in adding uh, aloe vera extracts to uh, different uh, composties and foliar sprays. Uh, that was something that uh, I did a lot with some of my friends in Portland years ago and uh, saw some really cool results. Uh, it's actually something I wanted to kind of get back to, but uh, I've kind of been busy lately. But uh, but uh, I, as far as it adding to stem strength, I'm not sure. But uh, I absolutely think that there's some properties to adding aloe vera to your uh, to your soil and to your foliar sprays, and you'll see a positive result. I think that's absolutely true. So aloe vera acts like a surfactant. So it helps to spread evenly water, uh, and it doesn't just drip off. It coats. So mm -hmm. it's a very, very uh, wonderful natural surfactant. And then, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Silica, is, especially if it's a bioavailable form, um, will definitely add strength to the stems as well as everything else in the plant. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole society called the Silica Society that travel the world. It's a it's a group of very wealthy people that try to tell farmers to dump beach sand on their soil. That's a little extreme. All right, eh, now you're just you're, you're you're creating a carbon fucking shit show doing that. Oh uh, yes, plenty of sand in the like a soil. Bad game of telephone. Some of these things, right? You know, there's plenty of sand in most soils. If there isn't, doesn't make sense to add it. There's better ways to do it with like stuff that the bioag has. That's exactly, yeah. silica. Available silica that's available to the plant. There's a lot of stuff out there that says silica on it that's in a dry form that is not like we were talking about with arsenic. It has to be an available form of silica. You know, otherwise you got to have sil silica soluble solubilizing bacteria that's going to get it there for you. You got to have one of the two, you know, or you got to have, uh, you know, someone that breaks it down to a form where it's available for you. That's what we did. Well, if, actually, that was what this uh, awesome company in Germany did. And uh, our product happened to be the key to making it work well. And uh, cool. uh, I, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that's another story. I think I think I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and this goes back to. Don't use diatomaceous earth as a source of silica. It doesn't work because you don't have the solubilizing bacteria no. necessary to break it down. And all it's going to do is fuck up an imbalance. And if you have any microorthropods or worms, it's going to fuck them up as well. So dangerous, we, uh, hard to use. We use molastonite in our soil, which is a calcium silicate. Um, you know, we use it for a couple of reasons. A, add calcium, A, add silica, and, and then B also is like a pH buffer as well. Um, but even, you know, minerals like that, I, I believe there's studies that have been done at universities on molastonite as soil to 
increase silica content and uh, you know increase overall plant mass. I was just reading one the other day and it said that uh, it didn't necessarily like increase plant size, but like the the wet weight of those plants was 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 much higher. Um, but there's even a, like that, not yeah. beach. Right, that's a great solution to to exactly that bioavailability. Bioavailability is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, chelated is what he's same asking. idea. Same idea. Same chelated. Idea. Chelated means it's a lot more bioavailable. Yes. You still need solubilizers and degraders, but you have a lot more of those available to do that um, when it is chelated first. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, this one's for you, Josh. Uh, affected micronutrients, uh, iron and zinc, etc. Will the TM7 supplement for this? Absolutely. You know, uh, TM7 is a great, great way to get there, uh, 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 specifically for uh, uh, zinc, uh, uh, particularly, is one that's, uh, uh, you know, Im very important and very overlooked. You know, back in the day, it was one of those uh, snake oils that I'd see all the time. It's, you see this, uh, it's a super charger grower supplement. And you look at the back, it's 0, .00 zinc, and it's the same stuff you can buy at the, uh, at the health food store for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. but it's one capsule to like five gallons. But you throw it on your plants, and if they're running a hydro food without any zinc in it, you see an awesome positive result right away, and they start growing faster because it was a micronutrient you were missing. You know, but uh, but micronutrients are micro. That means a little bit, a little bit of the time. They're easy to overuse. You know, mm -hmm. do not use TM7 more than let's say twice a week. You know, unless you're in a deficient, uh, a, using it to uh, affect a deficiency. Unless you're at the beginning of flowering, then you can use a little bit more. But uh, but really, the general rule is once a week, micronutrients. You don't need more than that. Cool. You know, I think another thing that people don't understand is that a lot of times these deficiencies are a direct result of missing micronutrients because the plant can't do its processes. Yes. Like, for instance, if a plant's taking up a ton of aluminum, look on the periodic table at the, in, the minerals both before and after and around the atomic weight. The reason it's pulling up that aluminum is because you're missing some of those other ones right around. Exactly. That's like the value of molybdenum. It's so mm -hmm. important. And, and people it's don't so overlook. Yeah, people don't realize the power of molybdenum. Mm -hmm. But now uh, we've uh, got a uh, okay. uh, we're going to have all of those available in amino acid forms, uh, enzymatically digested oh, over cool. the next several years. I'm going to have copper. I'm going to have iron. I'm going to have molybdenum. I'm going to have all the ones. You know, I'm hoping to have at least you know, let's say six or seven on the market here. You know, the, the problem, again, always labeling, packaging, oh, hey, another product, another place to put it. And government approval, you know. Government approval, registration. <laughs> uh, Leighton, is fish brew viable cost-wise for hundreds of square meters? And he's referring to, like, for lawns, not for crop production, dirt. Um, Absolutely. It's, uh, if you speak to Keith and you tell him, that you're doing this commercially. He has a separate uh, price data for farmers, uh, especially landscapers. He's really pushing hard because, you know, as he and I both talked about for years, one of the biggest polluters on the planet is residential homes. They're, they're fucking destroying everything. So he'll definitely help you out and give you a break if you explain to him what you're trying to do on a commercial scale. Well, guys, I know you guys have a flight to catch. Nate, you've got to run over to Josh's uh, to pick him up, to take him to the airport. So I don't want to hold you guys any longer than now. Um, so if you guys want to jump off, I don't know, Leighton, do you have anything left to, to no, add? I, I just want to say thank you so much, Josh and Nate, for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the time commitment to come on here. You know, Obviously, we are all about education, and so we appreciate the talk that you're taking time out of your life to come here and educate this community that we've built and the and the people that listen to it after the fact as well so thank you guys very much uh we're always here to help you know i, I always like to help spread the good word and you know if i can uh, bring my friends along while i do it i'm happy to do that all right you guys definitely look into fish brew start yeah, carrying, yeah. Yeah, start carrying it and promoting it all yeah, right we'll definitely have to have you guys back on but i'm gonna end the show so you guys can get going so peace out everybody <laughs> all right guys, care, everybody Thanks, Ken, as always, for all your hard work. You betcha. <laughs>